live, where news comes first. This is ABC7 Extra. Good evening. I'm Maria Garcia. Thank you so much for joining us here on ABC 7 Extra. Glad you're with us tonight. The El Paso Independent School District is in the eve of one of the most important decisions that will hugely impact our community, perhaps the most important decision in its history and in the decade. The Board of Managers right now considering if it should close 12 elementary schools and rebuild and reconfigure other campuses as well. After half a dozen committee meetings and workshops and seven town hall meetings, the district this week got the official recommendation about which schools to consider closing down. The problem stems from EPISD. Uh, for years, underestimating its future population, under, overestimating, I should say, its future population, and not preparing itself for a declining enrollment. Instead, the district continued to build schools while its population dwindled. And now we're here with the district saying it's simply too expensive to keep aging, underutilized campuses open. Instead, they say they could use that money for better educational programs. You'll be hard pressed to find someone on both sides of this issue who will tell you there is a great solution to this problem, but there is a necessary one. Joining me tonight, EPISD Board of Managers President D. Margo and EPISD Trustee Elect or Trustee in Waiting Susie Bird. You can email us your comments and questions now to abc7extra at kvi.com. By phone, we're at 496 1775, or you can tweet me at Maria G. ABC7. Before we get to our discussion, though, let's take a look at this week's developments. Uh, but the bottom line is we have no choice. We have to do something. EPISD's declining enrollment is expensive. With nearly 90 schools, the district says it's only at 76% capacity. The Jacobs Engineering Group estimates there are 17,000 empty seats in the district. The schools are getting older. The population is declining. What is the best way for us to utilize our money? EPISD says it's blowing millions on just keeping the lights on and maintaining these facilities, which is why they went to the Jacobs Group for advice. And after an extensive study, the group now recommends closing 12 elementaries, most in Central and the Northeast. The schools up for closures are Bond, Roberts, Vilas, Bell, Alta Vista, Zavala, MacArthur, Travis, Schuster, Collins, Fannin, and Newman elementaries. The group also recommends completely rebuilding 12 schools from the ground up. Those are Lamar, Douglas, Burleson, Burnett, Burgess, Dowell, and Bradley elementary schools, Moorhead, Bassett, and Ross middle schools, and Burgess, Andrus, and Jefferson high schools. It also recommends converting White, Lincoln, Bonham, and Terrace Hills to K through 8 schools and renovating Coronado, El Paso and Irvine high schools. It doesn't seem to matter how much I try to impress that this was an authentic, organic effort. Um, they, they, the trust, the distrust is just there. On top of that, the price tag for these changes is upwards of $850 million, which Jacob suggests getting in three bond elections split up in 2015, 2018 and 2021. If we can say, here's the program we're offering your child at this school, we may have to bust them to that school and close this down. What would you rather have? A building that we have to take care of or the program for your child? And invariably, I think they're going to say the program. All right, and joining us for our discussion now, President of the Board of Managers, Dee Margo, and Trustee in Waiting, Susie Bird. Thank you so much for staying up late with us. Thank you. Uh, let's start with, with you, Dee. Um, you know, it's really clear that, that EPISD for years didn't properly manage its declining enrollment, either ignored it or just mismanaged the, the, the situation. In the last decade, it built nearly a dozen schools, most of which are un being underutilized right now. So why should hundreds of children pay the price for that, lose the school in their neighborhood because a district mismanaged its numbers? Well, let me, let me kind of backtrack and give you the big picture of how we got here to begin with before we get into the specifics and, 
And let me remind your reviewers that nothing has been finalized yet. We've only had a recommendation made. We've not uh, discussed that as a board of managers um, at all. But how did we get here? There was no facility study since 2000. For 15 years, there's been no analysis as to the physical structures and the uh, composition of our district. It was, we started, uh, the trustees failed to, to do this historically. Normally you would do something like this on a, on a, uh, with, with the asset size we have and the number of buildings and structures about every five years. But it wasn't done. And they've known for years it was the old proverbial kick the can down the road. When we took over as a board of managers, there was very little money, I think six million or seven million, in the uh, budget process for repairs and any rehabilitation that might be done. That's not anywhere near what you would need for uh, the size of the number of buildings we have throughout the 94 campuses. Um, we contracted with Jacobs, but 90 days after we contracted with Jacobs, we found out about the enrollment problems. Your viewers need to understand the issue related to school consolidation was never ever envisioned by us, nor would we welcome that to begin with. Unfortunately, we identified a decline in enrollment. Why prior uh, uh, leadership failed to, to listen to the demographers, because they, they had that. But we ended up coming up with this, and as you said earlier, it's 25% of our classroom space is, is, is not utilized of where we have. And we have shifting demographics. You know, I mean, it's, it's obviously nobody wanted this situation. No. It's, a it's a terrible situation. I mean, you're, you're not going to find someone who says there's a great solution to this. It's, it's on, on both sides of the issue. Closing down schools but is, we a, have, is, a bad, we, is, is a bad situation to be in. We have the same pro Austin has the same problem we do. I was in Austin this last week. Tuesday, AISD expects 4,000 student decline. We're not unique. Everybody's going to have to deal with it, especially those of us who are landlocked. But, but they're, they're, you know, there's still the issue that, that EPISD, as you said, should have dealt with it, should have done a facility right. study every five years. They didn't do it. And now we're in this big mess, and, and some children are going to lose. We don't know for sure, but they may lose the well, schools in their neighborhood. We, we, have a, we have a finite supply of federal, state, and local tax dollars supporting our schools. Those dollars are predicated on the enrollment. Every thousand students we lose, and we're projected to lose, 1,000 students each of the next five years amounts to almost $9 million each and every year, if not more. We don't have the fund. We have to make these kind of choices that we really, none of us would want to make if we could or couldn't. I mean, it, it, it's, that's the fact. And, and you know, Susie, that's true. Nobody Absolutely. wants to make these Absolutely. decisions. Uh, there's no perfect solution, but some say there's a necessary solution, that it has to be done. The school district is a steward of public dollars, Absolutely. and, and they, they, you know, they cannot keep pumping millions of dollars into these aging facilities that are being underutilized right. uh, instead of using that money in educational programs that will unleash our children's potential. Absolutely. What I don't, do you I say don't to think, that? I, I think there's never been an argument at the big picture level. It's really when you kind of migrate that down to the public values level and how do we make these decisions? So, for example, um, one of the things I think is really important when you're making this decision is to make sure that it's done equitably um, across the board. Everybody feels the pain of it. If you look at what's been presented today, that's not the case. You have uh, parts of town um, on the west side w that have the lowest enrollment and no school closures are recommended. Meanwhile, in my area, you've got the Travis um, Burnett area with 99% enrollment for that area, the Alta Vista area with 86% enrollment, and there's school closures being recommended. And, and so for me, it's a, there's issues about fairness. And then really kind of the big picture is, I agree with, with Dee 100% that we've got to make these decisions. But I think the public has to be with us as we make these decisions. Um, and I think that they're willing to make uh, uh, tough decisions if they understand what the value uh, that comes back to uh, them in, in, if taxpayers but or But you, you've families. heard that, that out of a thousand surveys, four out of five taxpayers agreed with the solution. No, that's not accurate. Um, I, that, 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 that the survey results, I think, are 
kind of skewed. F so, for example, Trav the Travis Burnett area thing. So, y 200 people responded and, and weighed in on that particular area. Actually, only four of them are actually from those schools. Mm -hmm. So, for me, it d it's not a clear reflection of, th of the people that are going to actually have to live with it. Well, I want to take a look at that uh, of, of a map that we made. We made a map this week, and it shows the boundaries of the 12 elementary schools that are being considered for closure. Uh, and you can that percentage that you see on your screen is the projected occupancy by 2020. So, for example, Vilas Elementary, that's the one all the way down to the bottom of your screen where it says 50 percent by 2020. Uh, that's Vilas Elementary, which is next to downtown El Paso in Sunset Heights, projected to be at only 50% capacity, only being used at 50% capacity. But then look towards the middle of your screen. That's Travis Elementary School, also up for closure. And it's projected to be at 95% capacity in 2020, yet it's still being considered uh, for closure. And it's also in fairly good condition. So, so, so for, for taxpayers who are saying, wait, you're going to ask us to pay nearly a billion dollars to close some schools that are in pretty good condition and are being used. Let me clarify on those two. I did some checking. We, we received this information last, last Wednesday, uh, and I've been out of town since that time. So none of us have ever got, have gotten into the, to the details yet, uh, but I did make an inquiry uh, related to uh, Travis and Burnett. And the response I got was that we think this data is wrong, that they're not in that. Travis was uh, built in 55 and I think Burnett in 1950 or vice versa. So that the data we're looking at related to 95 percent and related to their facility cost index, we're not sure is correct. So, sh I mean, so, so shouldn't that be a red flag then in this process? If, yeah. if, you, if, you, have, if, if you went through well, this extensive study with that's why we've and you asked, paid an engineering yes. group, and, and, and now some, you're about to make an incredibly consequential decision, and then some of the facts are wrong. Shouldn't that be a signal to, to sort of stop and step back? Well, the, the signal is let's get the data on the page correctly and verify this. Now, if that is truly the case, then, then the, uh, others of us would want to know exactly what's behind the uh, rationale for what we're dealing with. Uh, so. The, the only thing I, we've dug up so far is that we think that the, some of those numbers may have been mis, miscategorized. Um, so I don't know whether it's a clerical issue or a true engineering issue, but, but we're going to get to the bottom. That's why we're still moving ahead on this. Okay. The, but, but, you know, the bottom line is what choice do we have? It's not a matter of haves and have-nots. It's a matter of going where the demographics lead you. Where are the students? Where's the population? That's been the basis for the decision. And it just happens that we're we're migrating to the northeast and the northwest. I know, but but you, you, some 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 schools are even um, more underpopulated than some of the schools that are up for closure, and and those aren't up for closure. So if it's just all about demographics, again, why is well? Why I mean, are I mean, that it's being used no, nobody's going to be happy with any process whatsoever. Nobody. We're doing the best we can. But with respect to what Susie said about the turnout and the voices, I mean, jeepers, we've got uh, single-digit voting for trustees. I mean, they're the ones that oversee all this. Wouldn't that be an important issue for people to become engaged with? That's been part of our problem from day one and across the state of Texas. But the, but the thing is, all we're trying to do is say, where are those children today and where are they going to be in five and ten years? And where can we apply those resources? But to say that we have 25% of our classroom space is basically empty is ludicrous. It's a waste of money. We're paying for that. That's money that needs to go to teachers and into the classroom. And how you sort that out is what we're trying to get to. And, and I think you heard from Susie saying that yeah. people, you know, taxpayers don't want to see their, their money going to waste on underutilized right. buildings. Uh, but if, if every step of this process, you hear this resounding, repeating message saying, our voices aren't being heard, this is a disenfranchising process, the, 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 the surveys, they're not conducive to meaningful contribution from the community. Maria, I, I, with all due respect to Susie and others, yes, you'll hear some of that. But I've also heard on the other side, we appreciate what you're doing. Keep it up. I got stopped at the Austin Airport by two uh, El Paso Independent School teachers on uh, on uh, Friday afternoon. I said, "Keep it up. 
And one of them had a father who was a retired school teacher who said the same thing. So, you know, I, I can't, we're doing the best we can with the data we have. None of us expected this to begin with. All we thought we were going to be looking at was the rehabilitation and the repairs of the schools. And then we got in and found out that this had not been handled correctly for many years because of improper demographics. And, and Susie, talking about the process, um, you know, you've been in public service, and you know that often the loudest voices aren't necessarily the, the, the right ones, and, you know? And, and that's why I think we could, we need to do much more in public outreach for this particular one, and really making sure that it's meaningful public participation. I don't know if you had a chance to look at how the survey was. It's like a 50-page document. You had to collate it against the report to find it. And mostly what I was seeing was parents, sort of the ones that w were, had the time to go dig up the data and figure it all out they were like emailing all of their friends to say okay go go look you know add in for this option that to me is not meaningful input really what's meaningful is for us to hear from families that are affected by this we want to know what what's missing at their school and maybe we can resolve some of those things that are missing in fine arts or or sports that that can be can be resolved with the consolidation okay. but we we haven't had that conversation and I think that's why you're getting so much of a reaction from people uh, where they feel like they're not included in this process I mean I've been on the steering committee and I still don't quite understand what the process is. Okay, um, we have Maria from Central on the phone. She has a, a comment or a question. Hi, Maria. What's your comment or your question? This is that the Board of Managers, though we are grateful that they are taking care of all this research as far as schools closing, opening, remodeling, the ones that really should be making the the decision is that our elected officials when they get elected in the summer because they will have to answer to us, the taxpayers, which are the voters. Thank you very much. And we've heard that before in this process that it should be elected trustees who make the big decisions on this and that you should post, wait well, until they're in office. As I said at the beginning, we had elected trustees over the last uh, 15 years. They failed to fulfill their fiduciary responsibilities in the whole, in the total, by failing to oversee and provide proper uh, due diligence over the, the f physical assets that we have for our children. I mean, we still have, what, $230 million worth of, if we, if we didn't change anything, just to still go from evaporative coolers to refrigerated air. I mean, that, I mean, some of this stuff is just ridiculous. It should have been dealt with before. You walk into Irvin High School, they have lots of issues. I mean, there are, the, so we've, we've had elected trustees several years ago, Schuster was supposed to be, Schuster Elementary was on the block to be closed. The trustees backed off. It was made, the facilities people made a recommendation. It's still knack on. The decisions aren't and, being and made. And I mean, aren't these big unpopular decisions susceptible to Absolutely. political deaths you know, when it's elected officials dealing with them? You know, here's, here's the way I feel about it. I, and I've, I've told this to Dee from the very beginning. I'm, I'm comfortable with either the Board of Managers or the Board of Trustees making the decision if it's a good process. It has not been, and, and right now we don't have a good product, I don't think. And so because of the timing of it, I think that in order to really engage the community in a way that they understand why the decisions are being made and how they're being made, and they get to really have a conversation about what they really want to talk about, which is how will my, stu my child's education improve if this happens? I, that's what they want to know. That's what they want to talk about. And that's the part we haven't done. It's kind of like the physician coming in, we're diagnosing the problem. Now, what's the, what's the solution? And, and that's where it's coming up next. It was assigned on Wednesday. Staff, the staff is doing that, not the engineers. It's, the, it's what parents and taxpayers will know now. If we implement some or all of this, what's in it for me? What's in it for my children? And that's the process we're working on now. Okay, we have to take a break. When we come back, we're going to go straight to the phone lines. We're going to take as many callers as we can, so stay with us. Welcome back to ABC 7 Extra. I'm Maria Garcia. We're talking today about the possible schools that may be closed in EPISD uh, and also the campuses that may be reconfigured uh, or rebuilt. Let's go to the phone lines. We have Nancy on the west side. Nancy, what's your comment or your question? What is going to happen to these aging buildings? Are they, are they going to tear them down? 
or what is going to happen to all these buildings? Thank you. I think the engineers said in their recommendation that they were going to, um, what they had built into the budget is that they would tear down um, the the buildings and then you know sell them or use them for another for another school district use. They put it under the topic of repurpose. Repurpose. It's still open-ended what can be done. I mean, part of the reason when we're, uh, which is not related to this, but uh, having to, to set up a new headquarters for EPISD, and we're working on that now because our lease is up in 17 and we've got to move out uh, because the way the city and the airport are charging us, is we're going to master plan the land in the northeast that we're, we're looking at uh, building on and then sell those parcels off as well for the general fund. Uh, you know, when I... Throughout this process, um, you know, some of our viewers have, that's one of the main questions we get. What's going to happen to the schools? Are they going to be sold? Are they going to be torn down? Um, but aside from just being responsible for what happens in the classroom, EPISD is, is a member of this community, and schools are anchors of neighborhoods often. Uh, and so tearing down a school or, or closing it down completely changes a, a neighborhood, and, and some people are concerned that their neighborhood will deteriorate if if one of their schools is gone yeah Maria I don't think anybody has a crystal ball or understands completely what will happen but I will tell you this if we can repurpose the buildings what the engineers and what others have told me and what others have done in similar circumstances is if they can find a tenant or sell the building or something then that's the that that's the greatest solution but if they can't then we need to figure out what can be done. Okay, we have a phone call from uh, Rick in Central. Rick in Central, what's your comment or your question? Mr. Margo, it's not so much of the closures, it's three more increases that you're proposing for the El Paso uh, taxpayer. Uh, aren't we paying enough school tax at this present time? I thought you were a conservative. Also, we're also looking at a hospital that's also going to be requiring more money. Please reply. Thank you. I agree. It's a challenge. We're uh, between the proverbial rock and hard place. To do nothing would cost $850 million, just under a billion dollars, to take the schools and bring them up and improve them and all that. So we're, we're looking at uh, uh, what are we going to do? We're going to have to do, uh, as, I re as I recall, if I can get my data here, what we're talking about if this is correct, is re um, we're talking about uh, rebuilding, converting, renovating, and repurposing. And that's what it's going to cost. I mean, we're, we're talking about rebuilding 12 schools. We're talking about uh, rebuilding and converting four other schools. We're renovating three. You, you know, just so, uh, it, it, more than eight hundred and fifty million dollars. It's 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 a lot of money to ask from taxpayers. And and when you have issues like oh, there may be um, miscalculated data or miscategorized data in in one of the schools that were considered closing, and and that's part of the data that goes into the decision of whether to ask taxpayers for eight hundred and fifty million dollars I mean surely you can see why residents are concerned well remember what I said just previously before the break I said what we've done so far is identify the problem and the dollars associated with it we made our diagnosis and this is the estimation of what it's going to cost now what's the solution the old what's in it for me as taxpayers as teachers and as students and that's what we're working on next we're not rushing into this at all we all understand that. Um, there is a cost-benefit analysis, but to do nothing actually costs more. Okay. So that's what we're looking at. Susie, that, that's true, absolutely. To do nothing would, would cost more. But there's a lot of rebuilding that's recommended in the plan that for me, uh, as a taxpayer and somebody that will represent the taxpayer um, in May and June, is excessive. And th there's a lot of um, information in this report and recommendations in this report that I really think, again, need m much more public involvement and engagement, but also need a lot of people asking questions because they just don't, some of them just don't make sense to me. Okay, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that when we come back, plus we're going to take uh, more phone calls and some of your tweets, so stay with us.
Welcome back to ABC 7 Extra. Let's go straight to the phone lines. We have Pat in central El Paso. Pat, what's your comment or your question? I was wondering how come you're going to keep Bonham open if they uh, do not have a gymnasium, football field, anything for the 7th eighth, uh, and 8th graders to play basketball? And MacArthur already has that built. How is that going to be less expensive than to keep MacArthur open? T. Margo, would you like I to? don't remember anything related to MacArthur, but I haven't looked at the Pacific, so... I don't know. As I said, we haven't gotten into it. The idea is... Uh, MacArthur is on the list. Is of it the on 12, the list? Uh, on the 12 elementaries it's considered for closure, okay. yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have an answer on that. We're, we're, we're getting into it. Uh, as I say, the first we received this information was Wednesday of last week. Okay. Um, we have a, a tweet from, uh, let's see here, from John. I agree with Susie Bird. Why aren't schools on the west side being considered? I know there are two elementaries on the west side that are being considered for closure, but he wants to know, it's always the areas with low income that get shut down. Um, if, we, if, we look, if we look at the map, uh, I mean, Savala, Alta Vista, considered being closed, but then, you know, there's rebuilding of Coronado High School, um, which some may consider excessive. So for those kinds of concerns, what do you say? Well, I go back to the basics. What's driving it? The student population. No, that's not true. And the, the, there's an area on the west side, like 82 in this report, it's the lowest utilization in the entire district. And not one, not one school is being recommended for closure. Not one single. What, what know, area? Um, what it's area like on the west AE2, side? AE2, like Putnam, uh, Green, that area. And then meanwhile, Alta Vista is being recommended for closure this year. Hopefully that will not happen. It has 378 students. They'll go to three schools that only have a capacity of 254 seats. So essentially, we're going to overcrowd uh, uh, areas in my district um, w when we're like leaving one area that has the lowest utilization in the entire district. We're leaving it totally. They don't have any school closure proposed. I can't address that. I haven't looked at the specifics on it. Well, all we've done is had the overview and the recommendations. Now we're going into it. The Board of Managers is going to uh, visit all of the schools that were recommended for closure. We're going to go see firsthand everything, the schools we haven't seen. And uh, we're asking the uh, staff to give us the report on the old, as I said earlier, what's in it for me? Where, where, where are we going from here? How are we going to tie in the academics to the changes we're making? Uh, Mike tweeted us, I don't want my dad to lose his job at Roberts Elementary. What will happen to EPISD staff uh, immediately, that will be immediately impacted uh, when campuses close? Well, the teachers follow the students, so the teach, it's, not a, it's not an issue related to teachers, but you, you know, it, it will affect administration for sure. You don't need principals if you don't have a school. Okay. Um, Adriana tweeted, some schools have portables. Is there not enough space for children? How do you justify the closure if some schools have portables? Well, we've taken, we took into account that. I think we had something like, I, had, I won't pull my notes out, but something like 8,000 portables. Uh, and that's part of what we're trying to address. Uh, Eduardo tweeted, redrawing attendance zones should be the priority before closing any schools. It's done simultaneous. We're, do, we're looking at that as well. That is part of the whole process, was the realignment of, uh, of uh, uh, district lines, schools, school lines. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's essentially, I think one of the issues here, and, and this is not meant to be a sentimental question, but some children will not be able to walk to school anymore. And that may seem kind of trivial in the grand scheme of things, but those are the kinds of things that, that make up life, that make up quality of life. If we have the money, we wouldn't make any change. No one would be arguing, and we, re -re we would uh, be going to bonds. I mean, we have a $480 million budget, and we got $800 million worth of, of uh, changes that need to be made, rehabilitation and repairs. So how are we going to do it? If you want your school, are, are you going to pay more to have it open? I doubt that. What we're trying to do is where are we today and where are we going to be in the future? And unfortunately, those were not questions that were addressed properly by prior trustees or administration.
Well, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Dee. You bet. Thank and you. And thank you, Susie. Thank you I very much. Thank, thank you. And thank you so much for joining us. We hope you found this informative and helpful. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.